two, the problem of work. The tyranny of the clock. In no characteristic is existing society in the West so sharply distinguished from the earlier societies, whether of Europe or the East, than it is in conception of time. To the ancient Chinese or Greek, to the Arab herdsman or Mexican peon of today, time is represented in the cyclic process of nature, the alteration of day and night, the passage from season to season. The nomads and farmers measured and still measure their day from sunrise to sunset and their year in terms of seed time and harvest, of the falling leaf and the ice thawing on the lakes and rivers. The farmer worked according to the elements, the craftsman for so long as he felt it necessary to perfect his product. Time was seen in a process of natural change, and men were not concerned in its exact measurement. For this reason, civilizations highly developed in other respects had the most primitive means of measuring time, the hourglass which is with its trickling sand or dripping water, the sundial, useless on a dull day, and the candle or lamp, whose unburnt rem remnant of oil or wax indicated the hours. All these devices were approximate and inexact, and were often rendered unreliable by the weather or the personal laziness of the tender. Nowhere in the ancient or medieval world were more than a tiny minority of men concerned with time in the terms of mathematical exactitude. Modern, Western man, however, lives in a world which runs according to the mechanical and mathematical symbols of clock time. The clock dictates his movements and inhibits his actions. The clock turns time from a process of nature into a commodity that can be measured and bought and sold like soap or sulchulence. And because, without some means of, ex of exact timekeeping, industrial capitalism could never have developed and could not continue to exploit the workers, the clock represents an element of mechanical tyranny in the lives of modern men more potent than any individual exploiter or than any other machine. It is valuable to trace the historical process by which the clock influenced the social development of modern European civilization. It is a frequent circumstance of history that a culture of civilization develops the device that will later be used for its destruction. The ancient Chinese, for example, invented gunpowder, which was developed by the military experts of the West and eventually led to the Chinese civilization itself being destroyed by the high explosives of modern warfare. Similarly, the supreme achievement of the ingenuity of the craftsmen in the medieval cities of Europe was the invention of the mechanical clock, which, with its revolutionary alteration of the concept of time, materially assisted the growth of exploiting capitalism and the destruction of the medieval culture. There was a tradition that the clock appeared in the 11th century as a device for ringing bells at regular intervals in the monasteries, which, with the regimented life they imposed on their inmates, were the closest social approximation in the Middle Ages to the factory of today. The first authenticated clock, however, appeared in the 13th century, and it was not until the 14th century that clocks became common as ornaments of the public buildings in the German cities. These early clocks, operated by weights, were not particularly accurate, and it was not until the 16th century that any great reliability was attained. In England, for instance, the clock at Hampton Court, made in 1540, is said to have been the first accurate clock in the country. And even the accuracy of the 16th century clocks are relative, for they were equipped only with our hands. The idea of measuring time in minutes and seconds had been thought out by the early mathematicians as far back as the 14th century, but it was not until the invention of the pendulum in 1657 that sufficient accuracy was attained to permit the addition of a minute hand, and the second hand did not appear until the 18th century. These two centuries, it should be observed, were those in which capitalism grew to such an extent that it was able to take advantage of the Industrial Revolution in technique in order to establish its domination over society. The clock, as Lewis Mumford has pointed out, represents the key machine of the machine age, both for its influence on technics and for its influence on the habits of men. Technically, the clock was the first really automatic machine that attained any importance in the life of men. Previous to its invention, the common machines were of such a nature that their operation depended on some external and unreliable force, such as human or animal muscles, water or wind. It is true that the Greeks had invented a number of primitive automatic machines, but these were used, like Hero's steam engine, either for obtaining supernatural effects in the temples or for amusing the tyrants of Levantine cities. But the clock was the first automatic machine that attained a public importance and a social function. Clockmaking became the industry from which men learnt the elements of machine making and gained the technical skill that was to produce the complicated machinery of the Industrial Revolution. Socially, the clock had a more radical influence than any other machine, and that it was the means by which the regularization and regimentation of life necessary for an exploiting system of industry could best be obtained. The clock provided a means by which time, a category so elusive that no philosophy has yet determined its nature, could be measured concretely in the more tangible terms of space provided by the circumference of a clock dial. Time as duration became disregarded, and men began to talk and think always of lengths of time, 
just as if they were talking of lengths of calico. And time, being now measured in mathematical symbols, became regarded as a commodity that could be bought and sold in the same way as any other commodity. The new capitalists, in particular, became rabidly time-conscious. Time, here symbolizing the labor of the workers, was regarded by them almost as if it were the chief raw material of industry. Time is money became one of the key slogans of capitalist ideology, and the timekeeper was the most significant of the new types of official introduced by the capitalist dispensation. In the early factories, the employers went so far as to manipulate their clocks or sound their factory whistles at the wrong times in order to defraud the workers of a little of this valuable new commodity. Later, such practices became less frequent, but the influence of the clock imposed a regularity on the lives of the majority of men which had previously been known only in the monastery. Man actually became like clocks, acting with a repetitive regularity which has no resemblance to the rhythmic life of a natural being. They became, as the Victorian phrase put it, as regular as clockwork. Only in the country districts, where the natural lives of animals and plants and the elements still dominated life, did any large proportion of the population fail to succumb to the deadly tick of monotony. At first this new attitude to time, this new regularity of life, was imposed by the clock-owning masters on the unwilling poor. The factory slave reacted in his spare time by living a chaotic irregularity which characterized the gin-sodden slums of early 19th century industrialism. Men fled to the timeless world of drink or Methodist inspiration, but gradually the idea of regularity spread downward among the workers. 19th century religion and morality play their part by proclaiming a sin of, quote, wasting time. The introduction of mass-produced watches and clocks in the 1850s spread time-conscious among those who had previously merely reacted to the stimulus of the knocker-up or the factory whistle. In the church and the school, in the office and the workshop, punctuality was held up as the greatest of the virtues. Out of this slavish dependence on mechanical time, which spread insidiously into every class in the 19th century, there grew up the demoralizing regimentation of life which characterizes factory work today. The man who fails to conform faces social disapproval and economic ruin. If he is late at the factory, the worker will lose his job, or even, at the present day, find himself in prison. Hurried meals, the regular morning and evening scramble for trains or buses, the strain of having to work to time schedules all contribute by digestive and nervous disturbance to ruin health and shorten life. Nor does the financial imposition of regularity tend, in the long run, to greater efficiency. Indeed, the quality of the product is usually much poorer because the employer, regarding time as a commodity which, was, which he has to pay for, forces the operative to maintain such a speed that his work must necessarily be skimped. Quantity rather than quality became the criterion, the enjoyment is taken out of the work itself, and the worker in his turn becomes a clock watcher, concerned only with when he will be able to escape to the scanty and monotonous leisure of industrial society, in which he, quote, kills time by cramming in as much time-scheduled and mechanicized enjoyment of cinema, radio, and newspaper as his wage packet and his tiredness will allow. Only if he is willing to accept the hazards of living by his faith or his wits can the man without money avoid living as a slave to the clock. The problem of the clock is, in general, similar to that of the machine. Mechanical time is valuable as a means of coordination of activities in a highly developed society, just as the machine is valuable as a means of reducing unnecessary labor to a minimum. Both are valuable for the contribution they make to the smooth running of society, and should be used insofar as they assist men to cooperate efficiently and to eliminate monotonous toil and social confusion. But neither should be allowed to dominate men's lives as they do today. Now the movement of the clock sets the tempo of men's lives. They become the servant of the concept of time, which they themselves have made, and are held in fear, like in Frankenstein, by his own monster. In a sane and free society, such an arbitrary domination of man's functions by either clock or machine would obviously be out of the question. The domination of man by the creation of man is even more ridiculous than the domination of man by man. Mechanical time would, would be relegated to its true function of a means of reference and coordination, and men would return again to a balanced view of life no longer dominated by time regulation and the worship of the clock. Complete liberty implies freedom from the tyranny of abstractions, as well as from the rule of men.